Hello to everyone today as we continue this series of studies on the gospel in the setting of end time events. Our topic for today is God's everlasting covenant. We're still looking at aspects of the gospel and I'm sure we will be blessed as we look at this subject today. These programs are being recorded in Kurumbong in the middle of our summer season and it's very hot today. And one of my favourite verses came to my mind, found in Ezekiel chapter 44 and verse 18. Speaking about the priests, it says, They shall have linen bonnets upon their heads, and they shall have linen breeches upon their loins. They shall not gird themselves with anything that caused the sweat. So I have Bible authority to remove my coat today. I hope nobody is offended by that, but here in Australia we often preach without a coat on because of the weather. That's much more comfortable for me. <clears throat> Thank you. All of us have made promises of various kinds. We have signed contracts, made high purchases, Many of us have made marriage vows and baptismal vows, or we've gone to the bank and signed up for a bank loan. These are all promises or covenants. And God himself has made a covenant. He's made a covenant with the human family called in scripture the everlasting covenant. And that's the subject for our meditation this afternoon. In 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 5, I read about the everlasting covenant that God made with King David. Included in that covenant was the promise that Christ would come through his descendants to be the saviour of the world. In 2 Chronicles, sorry, 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verses 14 to 16, I read again about the everlasting covenant that God made with Israel in which Canaan was to be their promised home. Canaan, of course, was a type of the heavenly Canaan, which will be the home of God's redeemed people at the end of time. Now, when God made his covenant with the human race, it had two aspects. One we call the heavenward aspect, a covenant made between the Father and the Son, between members of the Godhead, to save the human race if they should fall into sin. We know that they did, and so the covenant then became effective. I'm reading from The Faith I Live By, by Ellen White, page 76, these words. As the divine sufferer hung upon the cross, angels gathered about him, and as they looked upon him and heard his cry, they asked with intense emotion, Will not the Lord Jehovah save him? Then were the words spoken. The Lord hath sworn and he will not repent. Father and son are pledged to fulfill the terms of the everlasting covenant. And then she quotes John 3 verse 16. Christ was not alone in making his great sacrifice. It was the fulfillment of the covenant made between him and his father, before the foundation of the world was laid, with clasped hands they had entered into a solemn pledge that Christ would become the surety for the human race if they were overcome by Satan's sophistry. And from the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 934, I read, The salvation of the human family has ever been the object of the councils of heaven. The covenant of mercy was made before the foundation of the world. It has existed from all eternity and is called the everlasting covenant. So surely as there never was a time when God was not, so surely there never was a moment when it was not the delight of the eternal mind to manifest his grace to humanity. That's why in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, we read about Jesus, where he is called the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. 
This is because the Father and Son had entered into this covenant to save the human race even before they were created. Jesus in time died on Calvary, but because God's promises are as good as done, as far as God was concerned, his death was as good as done from the beginning. In Romans 7, 16, verse 25, I read that the mystery of, that has been kept in silence through God's eternal, times eternal, of course, was now revealed in the death of Jesus on the cross. And the Desire of Ages, page 22, says, God foresaw the existence of sin and made provision for the terrible emergency. How glad we ought to be that we have a God like that, who knowing the end from the beginning and knowing what was going to happen, made a promise between father and son over a plan of salvation whereby we may be redeemed and restored into favor and harmony with God. Then there is a second aspect of God's everlasting covenant, and that is called the earthward aspect. The details now of this heavenly covenant has to be revealed to man so that they can understand it and take advantage of it. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And the first reference to the gospel in the Bible is found in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, where it talks about the seed of the woman being promised, which is a prophecy of the coming of Jesus. This is called the Proto-Evangelium, which is a Latin expression meaning the first good news. And certainly the gospel is good news for us. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, I read that for by grace are ye saved uh, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Salvation is likened to a gift. It says it is a gift from God. And there's one thing about a gift, you cannot earn it. If you earn something, it's wages, not a gift. Gift and wages are mutually exclusive. And salvation is a gift, which means that you and I cannot earn it. And I've thought about that many times. If our works contributed to our salvation, in total or in part only, then it would be very unfair for some people. You see, some people can earn more than others. What about the man who has great talent? He could use those talents to promote the gospel, to bring men and women to a knowledge of God's saving grace, and could do more to help God's program on earth than a person who did not have such gifts or talents. What about the man who has great wealth? We've all heard the name Bill Gates, one of the richest men in the world who doesn't think in terms of millions, he thinks in terms of billions. What about comparing his capacity to do God's work and help God's program along compared with the others who are less endowed with this world's wealth? The rich man would have an advantage over the poor man. And what about the simple fact of a man living a long life? He has more years in which to work to earn credit with God, if that was the way salvation was to go, compared with the youth who is cut down by some accident or by some illness before he's old enough to do very much to help God. So salvation puts everybody on level playing field because all of us can accept a gift from God some people who depreciate works forget to read the very next verse. After verse 9, which says, Not of works, lest any man should boast. Verse 10 says, We were created for good works. Yes, God wants us to do good works. But our good works do not earn us a place in heaven. We are not saved because we do good works. We do good works because we have been saved. 
by God's grace and by God's gift. When we come to look at the original words in the Greek language for covenant, we find that they had two words. We translate both of them by the English word covenant. <clears throat> but the significance of these two words in the Greek language is very important theologically. The first one I want to discuss is the word suntheikei, which is a negotiated covenant made between two more or less equal persons or partners. Each one discusses the terms and conditions of the agreement. This word is not used in connection with the plan of salvation in the New Testament. Why? Because we do not discuss the terms of salvation with God. God decides what they are. We are not able to negotiate. We can only accept or reject. We cannot ask God to modify the plan of salvation. As some people would say, well, you know, everybody's keeping Sunday, so why can't we do that? And the Bible says keep another day, the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week. We can't negotiate with God to change what God has stipulated is his will for us. A negotiated covenant. The second term is an, another word called diatheke, which is a commanded covenant in which a lord or a ruler sets forth the terms and conditions of a covenant that he proposes to offer to those who are under him. This is the word that the New Testament uses for God's covenant of salvation with his people. God decides the terms and conditions. We can only accept or reject his offer. We cannot negotiate the terms. So God's everlasting covenant in the New Testament is a diatheke, a commanded covenant by God who sets out the details of the covenant. Now I'd like to speak for a moment about what the Bible says about the old and the new covenants. If you look in the Bible, you'll find this terminology is used in a number of places. The old and the new covenant. And throughout the history of the Seventh-day Adventist church, some have had problems in understanding the theology of the covenants. Some have taught that the old covenant was made at Sinai and that it only lasted for a few days or weeks because the children of Israel then made a golden calf and worshipped it and the covenant was broken, violated. This view is rather inadequate because it leaves the people who lived before Sinai without a covenant. And no one is going to deny that they are candidates for salvation, the same as people who live in any other era of the history of the human race. Therefore, some have suggested that the old covenant must be considered as still being in force, even though it was broken at Sinai, despite people's idolatry, and that from Sinai till the New Testament times, when the new covenant replaced it, the old covenant was still in force, even though it had been violated. However, this does not solve the problem, for it leaves those who lived before the accident, as I have already said, without a covenant of provision. However, Scripture is clear that God's offer of salvation is for everyone. All men and all women of all ages. Therefore, we need to seek a clearer understanding of the theology of the old and the new covenants. And the Bible verses that help to provide the key to solve this problem is in Galatians chapter 4, verses 21 to 26. Galatians 4, 21 to 26. Let's have a look at them. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? Oh, have you ever been told by a Sunday keeper that because you keep the Sabbath, you are under the law? Yes, I'm sure most of us have been. What does it mean to be under the law? Oh, they say you think you're going to earn salvation by keeping the law, but we've already ruled that out because you can't earn salvation anyway. 
But we had a very good, clever answer to those that come up with that argument. We say to them, no, we are not under the law. You are. Because you are breaking the law, therefore you are under the condemnation of the law. Well, that might be a very clever answer to turn the tables on your theological enemies, but it is not good theology because that is not what the Scripture means when it says being under the law. Because I just read verse 21. Let me read it again. Tell me ye that desire to be under the law. Does anybody desire to be under the condemnation of the law? Of course not. Nobody desires that. So what is the meaning of this expression, under the law, when we look at it in New Testament passages? It means that we are using the law as a means to earn salvation. And that does not work, as we have already said. To be under the law is trusting in what works you can do for salvation, rather than trusting in the merits of Jesus and his righteousness, which is credited to us in the plan of salvation. Let me read on. Verse 22, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. You see, Sarah was not bearing children, and so Abraham got involved with Hagar, his servant girl, and produced a son, trusting in what he could do to help God out. Then it says in verse 24, a very interesting statement. For these things, the experience of Abraham with Hagar and then with Sarah, these things, he says, these things are an allegory or an illustration for those, these are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Hagar, or Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answered to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem with, is from above, is free, which is the mother of us all. What is Paul saying here? Paul is saying here that when Abraham got involved with Hagar, he was living under the old covenant because he was entrusting what he could do to help God along. But doing what he could do to help God in producing the heir to the, the ancestor to be the saviour of the world. And it didn't work. But the Bible here says that he is under the old covenant. Then it says that it also answers to Jerusalem of today, meaning Paul's day. What was the problem with the Jews in Paul's day? They were looking at their works on Sabbath keeping and obedience to God's instructions to be able to recommend them to God and for salvation, trusting in works for salvation. And Paul is saying here, anybody who thinks they can earn salvation is living under the old covenant. Those who trust in faith in God's provision and in God's gift, as Abraham did when Isaac was born, are living under the new covenant. And that applies to any period of human history. So let's review this again. When Abraham was involved with Hagar, Trusting in his own works, he was under the Old Covenant. Therefore, the Old Covenant predates Sinai. Didn't just start at the cross, uh, didn't just start at uh, Mount Sinai. When Abraham trusted God in faith and believed God's promise of a son through Sarah, he was under the New Covenant. So the New Covenant, therefore, was available to people before the cross. And that's a thought that some people don't take on board. They think the new covenant starts at the cross and goes on down to our day. But here, Paul is saying that Abraham was under the new covenant when he trusted in faith in the birth of his son Isaac. Then Paul says the Jews of Paul's day were still under the old covenant, 
trusting in their own works of the law because they were thinking what they could do to help God with the plan of salvation. Thus, the old covenant experience can reach this side of the cross as well as before the cross. So now we have a situation where we have the old covenant and the new covenant both existing before the cross, both existing before Sinai, and both existing after the cross. Like two railway lines, you need two lines to run a train, not just one, otherwise you've got a monorail. Parallel lines. So we must divorce from our thinking the idea that the old covenant only reply, refers to Sinai and the new covenant only refers to the cross and dates after the cross. It thus becomes clear that the way God's people react to God and the way they respond to his offer of salvation depends under which covenant they live. Now, with this understanding, we are now able to trace through the Bible and Bible history how men and women have responded to God's offer of salvation and thus see under which covenant they were living. Bear in mind that Abraham lived under both covenants at different times of his life. What about Eden after the fall? Genesis 3.15, the Proto-Evangelium that we mentioned a while ago, the first promise of a seed of the woman, first promise of a saviour, first good news of the gospel. Obviously, that was a promise referring to what they could experience under the new covenant. And when Cain was born, Genesis 4 verse 1, what did Eve say? In our King James Bible it reads, I have gotten a man from the Lord. But in the Hebrew it reads a little differently and it misses it in our King James translation. In the Hebrew it says, I have gotten the man from the Lord. And some commentators and Bible scholars have suggested that uh, Eve thought that maybe this baby boy that was born was the Redeemer. Unfortunately, he turned out to be the world's first murderer. Now, she was mistaken if that was what her concept was. <clears throat> then in the Garden of Eden, God provided coats of skins. Adam and Eve had made for themselves uh, fig leaf aprons to cover their nakedness. But a fig leaf garment sewn together is not very durable. Once they dry out and you sit down and rise up, there'd be much of it left behind on the chair and you would be uh, embarrassed. So the covering that they made represents their works, what they could do to provide for their need. God provided something far more durable, skins of animals and made tunics, the Bible says in King James, but the original language is that God provided tunics, tunics, of skins, a much more durable and adequate protection and garment. Just as salvation is provided by his sacrifice on the cross, God's made the provision. And there we see the gospel illustrated again. Now a statement from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 370 says, the covenant of grace was made with man in Eden. Ellen White got it straight. God made the everlasting covenant with Eden in the garden with Adam and Eve. To all men this covenant offered pardon and the assistant grace of God for future obedience through faith in Christ. So Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve had the provision of the new covenant or the everlasting covenant. What about Abel and Cain? Here we see a contrast when we have the story of their bringing of their sacrifices to the Lord. What did Cain bring? He brought vegetables, fruits from his garden, things which he had grown. He planted them, he watered them, he weeded them, he cultivated them, and then he harvested them and brought them to God. Something that was involving with his works, typical of the old covenant. But Abel brought a lamb representing Jesus, the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world, representing the coming sacrifice of Jesus. So he was living under the new covenant. 
And we've already seen how Abraham lived under both the Old and the New Covenant at different times of his life. So we need not go into too much detail about that again because we have already covered it. Now note God's Amazing Grace, page 129. Ellen White wrote, The covenant made with Abraham was the very same gospel which is preached to us. You get that? The covenant made with Abraham is the very same gospel preached to us. So that's the everlasting gospel. In God's Amazing Grace, page 135, the Abrahamic covenant was ratified by the blood of Christ on the cross. So that was the new covenant that Abraham had. After Abraham, we can look at Isaac. In Genesis 17, verse 19, we read about the prophecy that the everlasting covenant would be made with Isaac. The Lord appeared to Isaac, gave him the promise of Canaan, a type of heaven, to be the home of his descendants. And there he built an altar and worshipped God. So Isaac lived under the new covenant. Jacob also lived under the new covenant in his experience when he had the dream of the ladder with the angels of God ascending and descending on the ladder from heaven as he was fleeing from his brother Esau. And God said to him, In thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That was a promise of the Messiah. And so I, Jacob also lived under the new covenant. Now we come to the covenant at Sinai. At Sinai, God made a covenant with the nation of Israel in which they were to be his chosen people and to be a witness to the world of the coming Messiah. With this covenant also came the sanctuary services, which were designed to teach the people about the gospel. Also, the Ten Commandments were given to them as a charter of righteousness. We have already noted that God only has one way of saving men, that is, through the gift. As we read in Ephesians 2, verse 8, the gift of God is eternal life. Therefore, his offer of salvation through Christ and through faith in Christ was clearly included in the covenant that he made with the children of Israel at Sinai. It is called in Scripture the Old Covenant because it was ratified with the blood of animals, whereas the New Covenant, the Everlasting Covenant, was ratified with the blood of Jesus at the cross. In Exodus 19 and 20, and verse, uh, chapter 24, we read about the, the covenant that God made with them, giving of the Ten Commandments, and the covenant ratified by sacrifice and blood sprinkled on the people, in Exodus 24, 7 and 8. Note again that this covenant was a diatheke, a commanded covenant. God spelled out the terms. The people did not negotiate any of the terms with God. Their part was to accept what he offered them. Of course, if they rejected, they would not find salvation. Exodus 20, uh, 32 tells us the history of the people and how they did not keep this covenant. They made a golden calf and worshipped it. Now we come to Hebrews chapter 8, verses 7 and 8, where it talks about the first or the old covenant was said to be faulty. Not because God offered a faulty covenant to the children of Israel. The fault was not with God, it was with the people. For finding fault with them, the Bible says. The people responded in self-confidence. All that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. But they did not respond with faith in the coming sacrifice of Jesus. They were not converted. That is why they could not obey. Therefore they are said to have been under the old covenant. In Deuteronomy 5, 28-29, I read these words. God is speaking and he says, Oh, that there were such an heart in them that they would hear, fear me, and keep my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. This verse gives us a very good insight into a serious problem the people had, boasting about what they would do but not responding by faith. So the people at Sinai were under the old covenant because they were trusting in what they could do and they failed miserably. What did God offer 
the children of Israel at Sinai. He would not offer them a faulty covenant, so he must have offered them the everlasting covenant, what is called the new covenant in the Bible. Since God only has one way of saving men, what he offered them at Sinai was the new or everlasting covenant. Note what Ellen White has to say. This is in Review and Herald, June 23, 1904, page 8. I have been instructed to direct the minds of our people to the 53rd, or 56th chapter of Isaiah. This chapter contains important lessons for those who are fighting on the Lord's side and in the conflict between good and evil. Thus saith the Lord, keep ye judgment and do justice, for my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Every one that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain. This is the covenant spoken of in Exodus 19, Ellen White says. In Southern Watchman, March 1, 1904, she wrote, The covenant that God made with his people at Sinai is to be our refuge and defence. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and said unto them before their faces all these words. And all the people answered and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And all, of course, was based on their efforts. Ellen White says, this covenant is just as much in force today as it was when the Lord made it with ancient Israel. He offered them the new covenant and is just as much in force today as it was when he offered it to them. In Southern Watchman, March 1, 1904, she wrote, the covenant that God made with his people at Sinai is to be our defense and refuge. And Moses came and called there for the elders and laid before them all these words. And the people answered and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. This covenant is just as much in force today as when the Lord made it with ancient Israel. Israel could have lived under the new covenant, but they rose, chose to live under the old covenant because they trusted in their own works. Now what about the provisions of the new covenant? the everlasting covenant. It's interesting to know that in Jeremiah 31, we have a prophecy about the children of, of Israel going into captivity. Jeremiah said they would. But Jeremiah said that they would come back after 70 years. And God said that he would make a new covenant with Israel in this post-exile period, after their captivity in which he would write his law in their hearts, and they would be his people. The provision is also spoken about in the New Testament, in Hebrews chapter 8. In the New Covenant, God would write his law in the hearts of his people. The New Covenant is based on better promises, God's promises, not man's promises. And Hebrews 9 says, salvation comes through the blood of Jesus shed, not that of animals. Animal sacrifices only foreshadowed the coming of the death of Jesus. By extension now we can extend, we can say that whenever Israel trusted by faith in the righteousness of Jesus, they lived under the new covenant. But whenever they trusted in their own works, they fell under the old covenant. We face the same two choices today. Our choices decide under which covenant we will live. And I have a summary. On the left we have the new covenant and on the right the old covenant. Notice the comparison between the two. Under grace we live under the new covenant but under law, trying to do right by our own works, we live under the old covenant. Under the new covenant we act from inclination. We want to do what is right. But in the Old Covenant, sometimes we are acting contrary to inclination. We'd rather do the wrong. <laughs> doing right spontaneously or doing right from the dictates of conscience. Action prompted by love or action prompted by obligation of law-keeping. Under the New Covenant, love is the motive. Under the Old Covenant, it might be fear of punishment or the fate of the wicked that might motivate some people to do the right thing, but not because of love. 
The new covenant is effected through the power of God's Spirit, whereas under the old covenant it is human effort. The new covenant goes further than the law requires. But under the old covenant, it conforms only to what the law requires and does not go any further. Prompted by inward action or prompted by mere sense of duty. One requires a change within the heart, the other may be no change in the heart, no true conversion. Conduct inspired from within or dictated from without. The new covenant necessitates conversion, but the old covenant may be the efforts of an unconverted heart. The new covenant is the way of victory, the old covenant is the way of frequent failure and defeat, as we have seen in the example at Sinai. The way of the new covenant or the way of the old covenant. Now in Psalm 40, verse 8, I read my closing text. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Under which covenant do we choose to live? May God help us make the right choice, is my prayer. If you enjoyed this presentation, it is from my series, The Gospel in the Setting of End Time Events. See all of these videos in the playlist shown now. Should you have any questions, feel free to contact your local Seventh-day Adventist minister or church. Please see the description below the video for more information.